Law Review for their support of the symposium and future special issues. So be on the lookout for that. Next, I want to thank Shell and Eiffel um, uh, and LDF, uh, the Thurgood Marshall Institute, and especially Monique Dixon, um, who also worked tirelessly to pull these things together in the midst of a plague. I'm looking forward to talking with Sherilyn in just a little bit. Um, at CPE, I want to thank uh, Aliana, Sarah Beth, uh, Kim Buchanan, Hillary Rao, and Sarah Olson. And last, but for sure not least, um, I want to thank Kristen Powell. And just a brief note on Kristen. Kristen has been with CPE for four years and is leaving us to attend University of Chicago Law School in the fall. During her time with us, she has done everything from grabbing coffee to leading our international collaborations with foreign justice delegations. It is not a surprise to me or anyone else that she pulled together the logistics of this event with so little fuss and such fantastic execution, but it is worth calling out that she is an absolutely outstanding CPE citizen and that we all will be a different organization without her. Thank you very much, Kristen Powell, a name to watch. All right, so now the reason we're all here today assuming that I'm getting thumbs up that people are actually hearing me and I've not just been talking this whole time with no feedback because that is the plague of our era. All right. So today we're in the aftermath of an enormous series of storms. During this summer of plagues, we've seen the outrageous failures of a presidential administration become terrible pain in vulnerable communities. We've seen partisan greed be weaponized against our basic systems of democracy. And we've seen public lynchings followed by the legally dubious use of federal troops. But we've also seen our collective anguish at these plagues translated into big ideas about how to reimagine public safety. Communities coalesced around these and now ideas that sounded to many people like lunacy just a few weeks ago refuse to be ignored in every city across the nation. So today, we can easily declare that the time of big ideas in public safety is here. And black leaders in cities across the country have ushered that time into being. And importantly, it is exactly at this point when big ideas are most vulnerable. The point when they have to be translated from passions into policy. See, we're going into budget season in, in cities across the country. And that will be where we feel exactly how difficult it will be to make a new model of public safety a reality. So that's precisely where legal scholarship and legal activism can really shine. The goal of the legal scholarship and activism we're fortunate to hear today is to shepherd the passions born of injustice into rooms where they can become institutions that prevent injustice. To protect ideas until they have become the values we build our structures to reflect. So to everyone who has been glued to their televisions the past two and a half months, watching the unprecedented social uprisings, today I ask you, don't look away. The work is not yet done and the decisions we make, now that the cameras have turned away, will determine whether the pains the nation has felt will become another unanswered cry for change or the sacrifice that was necessary to bring change into being. So today we will hear from some of the best in legal scholarship in action. And first up, it is my pleasure to introduce Vanita Gupta. Vanita, for those of you who don't know her, and I assume all of you do, is a force of nature. She's a veteran of police litigation at the ACLU National Offices. Um, and Vanita cut, first cut her teeth on a little case in Tulia, Texas, that's now fodder for pretty much every first year law student learning about civil rights. She joined Obama's Justice Department as the principal of the Civil Rights Division, where under her leadership, the division produced landmark findings in Ferguson and Baltimore and Chicago and, and, and. She now helms the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, a coalition of civil rights organizations across the country that she took over from the legendary Wade Henderson. The field of public safety is simply different because of the work she has put into it, and I'm honored to call her a friend. Everyone on mute, please join me in welcoming Vanita Gupta. Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled that the Center for Policing Equity, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and UC Irvine School of Law are leading this urgent and necessary conversation about reimagining a new paradigm for public safety. I am so grateful to my colleagues, Phil Goff and Sherilyn Eiffel, and others that are on this call for their critical leadership at this time in particular, 
but always, and to all of you for tuning in and mobilizing for a just and fair America. I am here as we seek through our work to honor the lives of Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Sean Reed, Tony McDade, and countless other black people and people of color who've been killed by police officers. The people-led protests continuing across the nation are anything but a reaction to isolated incidents. Instead, the outcry is really a response to this country's long history of violence with impunity toward black people and other communities of color. And as law enforcement leaders themselves have acknowledged, from early slave patrols to the modern day criminalization of people of color, policing has enforced unjust laws and maintained structural racism. That history is alive today. It is not one unique to policing, but it is borne out in disparities across some policing practices, ranging from stops and searches to arrests and use of force. Black communities and communities of color deserve real justice. Structural change to eradicate white supremacy, freedom from unjust and targeted policing, and the spaces and resources to grieve and heal and to build anew. The same white supremacy that permeates our justice system and sanctions police brutality has also robbed many black communities of the resources they need and deserve, disparities that have only been further revealed and exacerbated by COVID-19. That's why in the aftermath of recent police killings, the Leadership Conference sent Congress a letter signed by more than 450 organizations outlining principles to transform policing practices and lead to more accountability. It's why we developed the Vision for Justice 2020 and Beyond platform to provide a roadmap for redefining public safety and rethinking justice in America from the ground up. It's why we continue to build power within and between our communities to bring an end to criminalization, police brutality, and white supremacy. And it's why we published the New Era of Public Safety report, working closely with families, communities, researchers, progressive law enforcement leaders, and local activists. Our advisors on the report included Chief Scott Thompson, who led the transformation and rebuilding of the Camden, New Jersey Police Department, and Ron Davis, former chief and longtime leader on police accountability and community policing. The report builds on President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force report and lays out community-centered policy solutions to equip communities and police departments with best practices for adopting changing uh, for adopting changes that will ch uh, transform the culture of policing. My tenure as the head of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division began just two months after 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot and killed by a police officer in Ferguson. The Justice Department was not perfect, but we understood our mandate to promote accountability and constitutional policing in order to build community trust. During the Obama administration, we opened 25 pattern of practice investigations to help realize greater structural and community-centered change, often at the request of police chiefs and mayors who needed federal leadership. This is not the Justice Department that we have today. The disruption of crucial work in the Civil Rights Division throughout the Justice Department to bring forth accountability and transparency in policing is deeply, deeply concerning. But in the absence of leadership from the administration, leadership elsewhere is critical. There is no going back to normal. We have to create a new way forward, one that truly transforms policing and leads to more accountability for communities. And our response in this moment must appropriately reflect and acknowledge the important work of Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives in bringing us to this tipping point. We've been pushing the Senate to take an important step by passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which reflects the strong accountability framework that we sent to the Hill earlier this summer. But we must also recognize that accountability is but one step to realizing systemic change that justice demands. It is time for us as a nation to reimagine public safety in a way that prioritizes upfront investments in community-led solutions and resources that center the dignity and respect for everyone. That means not just changing policing practices and culture, but shrinking the footprint of the criminal legal system in black and brown people's lives and investing in areas and supports that truly make us safer. Police chiefs, officers, and communities have all been giving voice to these issues. The irony actually is that this is one area where police officers and protesters come together. 
they understand that our nation's spending priorities are all wrong. That lawmakers have been spending billions to uphold the mass criminalization and incarceration infrastructure while divesting for decades in social supports and systems and services that communities need to be safe. We've criminalized everything from homelessness to school discipline to mental illness and mental health and more. It's the tale of two Americas, one set of communities that is saturated by police where people are arrested for living while black and where 911 too often is the only go-to response for families and individuals in crisis. Another where police are only present in serious situations. Some of our elected officials want to deepen divisions, but one need only talk to law enforcement leaders and rank and file officers to see the places of agreement. Too many people are criminalized and incarcerated, which has unfairly situated police as the first responders on the front lines of our nation's social and mental health crises. We can't expect officers to be first responders in all situations, but nor should lawmakers make criminalization the only uh, response to social problems. These are conversations that we need to have more of to drastically shift how we support every community and provide resources to, to thrive. These aren't easy topics with overnight solutions, but people across the country are focusing the nation on these crucial questions that could transform our communities and our legal systems and save lives. The outpourings of grief and generational pain we're seeing across America are a cry for public officials to take action and demand a new paradigm for public safety. We can't go through this cycle over and over again. And I look forward to continuing our work with the incredible groups and people that are gathered here today to end state sanctioned violence, to build legitimacy in our legal systems and in our sense of justice, to pass meaningful police reform legislation. It's time to reimagine what kind of America we want to build an America where all people can live safely and freely. Thank you. So I'm Kim Buchanan and it's my honor to moderate the first session of this webinar from federal intervention to black owned. And we have two fantastic panelists here, um, Barry Friedman and Monica Bell. So Barry Friedman is the Jacob D. Fushburn Professor of Law and the Faculty Director of the Policing Project at NYU Law School. He's also a reporter for, for the ALI's new, new section on Principles of the Law Policing. He's the author of Unwarranted Policing Without Permission and countless other scholarly, important scholarly works. Um, professor Bell is an Associate Professor of, uh, at Yale Law School with a secondary appointment as an Associate Professor of Sociology. She, her specialization is race, policing, and the criminal legal system. And her, and her expertise has led to many offers, many honors, too many to list here, including being recognized as a Harry S. Truman Scholar and a George Mitchell Scholar. She's worked as a Lyman Fellow for the Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia. Uh, in 2019, she received the Yale Law Women Faculty Excellence Award on a vote of the Yale Law student body. And, ne and next academic year, 2021-22, she'll be a visiting scholar at the Russell Sage Foundation. She's published in many prestigious venues from the Yale Law Journal to the Los Angeles Review of Books. Um, so Barry is gonna take us, Barry is gonna take us forward. Um, he'll be the first to speak. Um, and after that, we will hear from Professor Bell. Um, and then we will, we would love to have questions from you. So enter them in the, uh, so en enter them in the Q&A and uh, we will ask them if we can. Thank, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I'm gonna assume that uh, folks can hear me. I wanna thank UCI and CPE and uh, NAACP LDF. Uh, it's good to be here with so many good friends uh, talking about such an important issue. Uh, and I thank you all, uh, especially Phil for extending the invitation. I'm glad to be in conversation with uh, my good friend Monica Bell, whose work I admire deeply. Uh, so I'm talking about the federal role in establishing public safety. And I say public safety rather than policing because I too would like to ally myself with all of those now who are arguing that we need a more capacious view of public safety than uh, simply the protection function that police afford. And also uh, with the notion that we have asked too much of police officers in the United States uh, and we are basically criminalizing too much and sending police to deal with problems to which they are not apt. 
I want to uh, echo Vanita in that, but also uh, nod my head with Phil. I wrote a couple of papers on this. I've been writing them for the last two years, and it is indeed the age of miracles. Things that I thought were futuristic and impossible now are at least demonstrating the uh, capability of becoming uh, the norm, and so I'm excited about all of that. You can find those papers on SSRN. But I want to talk about the federal role, and the reason for that is math. There are some 40,000 jurisdictions in the United States. There are some 18,000 policing agencies. There are 50 states, and there's one federal government. And so if you think that there are issues with public safety and policing, then the federal government is an obvious place to look. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about the federal government's role because it's very often said that the federal government can't do much, that its powers are limited, that policing is a local affair and needs to be dealt with locally. Uh, and I want to, in the first part of this talk, make the point that that isn't true, that there's ample federal power to do what needs to be done here, but that unfortunately the federal government too often does not enough uh, or even does some deleterious things. And in saying that, because I am going to be critical of the federal government, I want to acknowledge the good work that's been done by Vanita and the DOJ Civil Rights Division during the Obama administration. Its pattern and practice investigations were crucial. We should have a great deal more of that. By Ron Davis running the COPS office that not only did collaborative reform, but worked so hard with so many of my friends and colleagues on the uh, President Obama's 21st Century Task Force report. There are important things that have come out of the federal government, but too often that's too little. And so in the second part of what I'm gonna talk about here, I wanna talk about why that is. And part of the reason is politics, but I think the most controversial thing I'm going to suggest is that there's an inherent conflict of interest within uh, the federal government, and particularly the Department of Justice, in terms of regulating and assisting with local policing, and it's something that we really need to think seriously about. So first, I just want to talk about the powers that the federal government has and how they're not used or used, uh, I think, in some difficult ways. There are four powers that the federal government has at its disposal to deal with policing. The first is the spending power. The federal government draws in an enormous amount of money in tax revenues and disperses it in any way it wishes. And it could use that spending power to uh, advance research and to set best practices uh, and to be a bully pulpit to see that all of that becomes uh, normal in the United States and, and regular. Uh, and it does some of that for sure, uh, but much too little and sometimes the wrong thing. So for example, research, the federal government spends really a pittance. It spends about $100 million a year on uh, policing research largely rather than public safety. Uh, and you might compare that to almost $6 billion a year spent on cancer alone. Uh, that research often is directed by uh, those engaged in policing and without adequate attention to community voices about what it is we need to learn. Uh, it's insufficiently evidence-based. It is insufficiently driven by cost-benefit analysis, including the social costs of policing. Uh, and many of the best practices that get touted are truly detrimental, such as DDACs, which is a proposal that the police use frequent traffic stops to fight serious crime. It's not ever been shown to do that effectively, but it has enormous costs in terms of racial profiling, in terms of fines and fees lev levered on people. So the spending clause could be used a lot more. But second, the federal government has the power to put conditions on spending grants that it makes. And the federal government uh, makes grants to a lot of policing agencies, and it does put some conditions on those grants, but they are far too few, uh, and they are not enforced very seriously. And it's interesting because this is the power that most often is touted by the for the federal government to regulate policing, but it's done badly. So for example, the federal government with some of its grants requires record keeping but anybody who looks at criminology data and the uniform crime reports will tell you that they are badly done very often. We have much too little information on use of force. We can't even say how many people are killed by the police every year. These are conditions on grants that are not enforced by the Department of Justice, and so much more could be done in terms of training attached to grants, training requirements, how equipment is used. The Third thing that the federal government has is that it has the power to, under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, uh, indicate to policing agencies uh, what needs to be done. And that's how pattern and practice investigations happen. But much more could happen under that. We could have a national use of force standard. We could have uh, required reporting on demographics of police stops and get at racial profiling. And finally, I want to point out that the Commerce Clause, the superpower of the federal government, could be used to regulate uh, any of the commerce and equipment that the police get, including surveillance technologies, 
We can't tell states what tech and, and state governments and local governments what technologies to use, but we could regulate those technologies to ensure that algorithms are not biased, uh, that privacy rights are respected, that data is secure. We do none of that. So the question is why? And it's not because of a lack of power, I think, but it's politics. Some of that is politics driven by contributions that uh, policing agencies make to uh, officials that become uh, uh, state and local officials, but also in Congress and an unwillingness to act. But part of that, I think, is an inherent conflict in the Department of Justice. So half of the Department of Justice does the sorts of things that Benita was talking about in terms of regulating policing. But most of the Department of Justice is an enforcement agency. It is law enforcement, just like the policing agencies that it ought to be helping to regulate. And so there are conflicts, and we see them in many ways. We see them in refusing to enforce conditions on spending grants. We see them on giving uh, equipment to the policing agencies around the country in very dubious ways, such as supporting stingrays with the requirement that those uh, police, local policing agencies not reveal that they're using the surveillance technology, funding license plate readers that are used very often in uh, racially discriminatory stops, facial recognition technologies, uh, uh, concerns about militarization, the fact that the DOJ itself doesn't like to use body cameras when FBI agents are out on the street. And so I think at bottom, we've got to get at this conflict and figure out a way to bring the federal government in a way into the game in a way that isn't conflicted. Uh, that's not going to be easy to do, whether it's a separate agency that looks at state and local policing, uh, whether we create something like the National College of Policing that the, uh, the United Kingdom has. And I don't want to exclude police voices in any of this, but they need to be brought together with community voices, and we need to figure out a way to regulate policing uh, that does not suffer from the conflicts that, uh, that are inherent in having a law enforcement agency regulating law enforcement. Thanks very much, Kim, and I look forward to hearing from Monica. Thank you so much, Professor Friedman. Um, and uh, I, I know that I want to make sure that there's enough time for comments and questions. So let's move straight on to Professor Bell. Hey, uh, I'm Monica Bell. It is a pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to say a little bit about um, my work in general to tie to a larger point about the movement for defunding and what it uh, hopefully uh, could mean for um, the prospects of how policing will move uh, going forward, uh, moving to the black owned portion of the title of this segment. So uh, my work uh, is primarily uh, working at the intersection of law and sociology, and I do qualitative field research uh, in predominantly black uh, communities, uh, basically having to do with people's overall experiences of the state. And through the process um, of that research, I've focused a lot uh, over the past uh, decade or so on policing. And uh, one of the key exciting pieces of the conversation we're having right now is that really for the first time that I'm aware of uh, since the, the confounding of the police, we're having serious conversations about the role of policing uh, in promoting public safety and basically questioning the tie between policing and public safety. While that is really exciting, Exciting. It also uh, has a lot of potential pitfalls, and I'm going to tie a little bit to what Barry was talking about um, in the conversation. Uh, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to start uh, actually with a point that I was going to finish with uh, <laughs> as a way of tethering to, to what Barry was talking about. So uh, one piece of this conversation about funding has to do with research. And a lot of social science research, particularly criminology, has been complicit in limiting our understanding of policing uh, and, and kind of the capacity of policing with respect to public safety. So um, uh, one thing, or kind of one role that social science can play in the conversation that we're having is to evaluate new ways that communities are building public safety. So I'm thinking here in particular about uh, transformative justice. Uh, I'm, I'm also thinking about other kind of modalities of building public safety. We essentially need uh, social science research to kind of instead of reinforcing notions uh, 
that policing is our, our primary pathway to public safety as kind of has been for the past several decades, to instead begin interrogating, uh, or to begin evaluating programs, helping to figure out best practices in our conversation about alternatives to, to current systems. So I'm gonna back out of that to talk a little bit about uh, the movement for defunding and kind of a critical question um, in terms of how we're going to move forward from from that that conversation, so you know, there's been a lot of talk about the the movement to defund the police, uh, and and this is um, operating primarily on a local level of most of these conversations because of what Barry was talking about earlier, the 18,000 plus police departments. Um, and of course, because of local government law uh, and police unions, et cetera, that conversation meets a number of roadblocks. The conversation also meets a number of roadblocks because um, of a really complicated dynamic in which uh, a lot of people who might not be fully signed on to all parts of the, the defund agenda are using some of the language, the longstanding language of divest and invest, the so divesting from police and investing in something alternative. And so the big question, um, you know, once, once we get past the local government uh, and political barriers to even do some modality of defunding or reducing funding to policing, the question then becomes, where do you invest the money? And there have been uh, some really complicated debates, um, and I'm going to zero in, in particular in this conversation on Seattle, um, where I've been engaged in some virtual research over the past uh, five months. So, um, and it's also kind of like a hotbed of these conversations about defunding the police. So, um, uh, one thing that has uh, come up um, in, oh, I only have two minutes left, but okay. So, uh, well, one thing that has come up in, the, in conversations about defund is essentially uh, are the alternatives black owned? Are they community led types of alternatives? Or are we looking to invest in alternatives that might build public safety, but aren't traditionally thought of as community led and are, are not black led? So in the context of Seattle, this has come up in conversations about this program that I'm sure most of you are familiar with because of its national scope, and that's this program called LEAD. Now, until recently, LEAD was uh, leased for a law enforcement assisted diversion. Uh, and uh, as, of re as of a few days ago, essentially, LEAD, has now, LEAD now stands for Let Everyone Advance with Dignity. Now, what is that about? <laughs> that is about transforming program uh, to become more like, uh, to kind of make its, its role as a community-centric program more prominent. Um, and the program really has to do with behavioral health more than it has to do with promoting law enforcement. So we've seen this transformation in the program. But then a question is, this program, which is not Black-led, um, this program which has worked cooperatively with law enforcement in the past, where does it sit as a potentially transformative alternative uh, to uh, traditional forms of law enforcement? Now, so one part of the kind of defund movement might say that is not a community-led um, type of organization. And, it's, and so the kind of reparations function of divestment uh, and investment isn't happening there. Um, there's another view that would kind of focus more on the capacity of the organization to promote behavioral health. So I don't have a lot of time to go into that in a lot of detail, but essentially what I wanna do is crystallize this question about uh, what are we investing in and uh, how to think about that, those investment and alternatives um, as we move toward a defunding model. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Val. Well, I'm sure that all of us wish we had more time to, uh, to hear you and Professor Friedman flesh out your thoughts. Um, I know that I have questions and I think I'll uh, exercise my moderator's privilege to ask the first one. Um, and, and that is, so both of you are concerned with community voice and how to make sure that communities uh, have more say in the way they are policed. Um, and I would love to, hear more from both of you about how you see that happening and how, what's the accountability? How do we know who represents the community and how do we make sure that the government will listen to them? So I'd, I'd be, 
I, I would be fascinated to hear both of your thoughts on that. Um, okay, I can start, I can start with it. Um, so uh, I guess one question, one point is about the question. So uh, com community representatives, like is, there's this, there's this inherent um, kind of we and them, the technocrats and the community that's, implic that's implicit in some ways in the question. And so we've had these types of conversations for a long time. That's why we've had civilian review boards, we've had different other you know, modalities for giving communities voices. And there are always, always these questions about what is the community. Uh, we need to move toward a model of community control, I think, in, in which um, uh, figuring out who the legitimate voices are is not the primary question. And instead, the question is, how are we structuring this conversation such that um, uh, it is not about technocrats deciding who should be at the table, but instead, who, like, where is the table? Um, and so that's, that's my first intervention there. You know, I, I agree with, with Monica here. I, uh, a lot of my early scholarship in this area was about um, assisting with community voice and a lot of the work we did originally at the policing project was about um, community engagement with the police but you know i've come to believe that though engagement is important in many ways uh, in terms of relationship building and whatnot uh, really what we need are formal structures i mean monica's right we shouldn't be having a debate about how uh, we're going to hear community voices we need uh, structural ways to do that. And, uh, you know, I just want to shout out among them uh, police commissions, which some jurisdictions have, uh, which are lawfully enacted bodies uh, that, that have, you know, members of the public that sit on them and determine policy, just like we would for school boards or zoning boards or any other part of government. There's always a risk if you don't have some sort of a formal body uh, that you're going to not be actually hearing, you know, sort of the overall voice of the community, but from a part of the community. Of course, there's always a risk when you have a formal body that you're excluding part of the community. So that's tricky and that's important and well-running well police commissions ought to have the means of hearing from every segment of the community, particularly those who are most affected by policing. Uh, but I do think we need something structural to, to get past this question, Monica says, that we're always debating and it doesn't get us far debating it. Monica, would you like to respond to that at all or? No. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much for, for those thoughts. I think it, it is so important. I, I was, um, I, I'd like to, we don't have too many questions from the audience yet. So I would encourage you to submit questions um, if you have them. Um, and while we're, we're waiting for a few more of them, um, I wondered if uh, I might ask you to expand on, uh, if you, I might ask you to expand Professor Bell on the notion of not just community voice, but community control. Um, what kind of institutions would we need to have to, so that the police were truly accountable to community? Right, so, um, so here I'm, gonna, I'm drawing a little bit on the work of Jocelyn Simonson, whose um, work I wanna lift up. Um, so uh, uh, people have been writing and thinking a lot about what community control would look like. And so here, here are some kind of basic mechanisms. So uh, one um, is, you know, and this is, you know, this has been tried before. So, well, I don't know, I guess I'll put it this way. I think we've tried a lot of mechanisms that theoretically could be viewed as pathways to community control, um, but that a, every step along the way because of political dynamics are diluted to the point where they no longer function that way. So I actually don't think there is like a, a silver bullet structure that is going to ensure that we have community control. Um, so one example of a way you could have something that is more like community control is to have, um, this is actually something that Barry Friedman and Maria Ponomarenko have proposed, um, these um, kind of idea of having notice and comment rulemaking for police, for example, in which there is 
kind of, there are built in structures of community accountability. Now, are those always going to be perfect? No, there are ways in which um, community voices can be shut out of those processes. Um, but uh, the key is to have structural mechanisms and not just community meetings, which has often been the way in which we think police can be made accountable to communities. I'll say other, one other quick thing, and that has to do, like, so we, we use the language of accountability, and I think we need to be really clear about um, what that means. And um, so uh, often uh, conversations about accountability flow toward, you know, criminal, criminal accountability or civil accountability for uh, engaging in some particular sort of violence. But I think one thing that's clear is that there is something endemic to policing. And this is something I've written about in my work on legal estrangement and in my work on segregation. There is something endemic to policing uh, in America that makes it function as a system of racial control. So even if you have something really bold and interesting and new things um, that, that um, David Kennedy and others have talked about in terms of um, reconciliation processes and these kind of, you have these deep processes, um, uh, you still may ultimately um, uh, avoid accountability so uh well but, but but some of these processes need to be used in order to get to deeper forms of accountability for the routine structural violence of policing so i just want to be clear when I, that when i'm talking about accountability it is not kind of accountability for policing gone wrong it is in fact accountability for policing gone right or policing doing what it does as a routine practice Monica and I are in complete agreement about this, which is that too often when we talk about accountability, we mean what we at the policing project we call back end accountability, which is something's already gone wrong. And we don't think enough upfront about front end accountability, which is making sure that policing uh, looks the way that we want it to look and public safety as well. So, you know, there, there have been questions in the, in the Q and A about what we mean by defund, what, what people who talk about defund mean. I prefer to talk about reimagining public safety. Uh, about an awareness that the police answer all kinds of calls other than criminal calls. Uh, and that's true. But the question is, what are the right responses to these many needs in the community? I mean, that's the kind of work that Monica's doing. And it's not clear that uh, if we thought through it, the right response to every uh, community need, the kinds of things that 911 gets called for, would be somebody who's armed uh, and whose job is primarily uh, enforcing the law and who's trained very much in the use of force. And so what's exciting to me, and I talk about this in a piece disaggregating the policing function that's coming out in Penn Law Review and, and uh, has, has gotten actually a lot of media attention. I'm surprised. I'm one of these legal scholars that thinks I operate in the dark mostly and nobody ever reads anything I write. It's been downloaded a ton of times, but I think it's because it resonates in society right now, which is we have got to think of other mechanisms to, to help communities get the support that they need other than using the police. And you know, Vanita was completely right about this, which is you will find a lot of agreement. I mean, and this is where the activists and the police actually are going to agree with one another because the police themselves know that they're called into a lot of situations uh, which are not ideal. Kim, if I could just say one really quick word because there've been some questions in the chat about, you know, including a couple of somewhat aggressive ones about how could a, a license plate reader be racially biased because it's just reading license plates. And I just want to say, and I, you know, I really do think uh, that the Department of Justice and the U.S. government are deeply culpable in the use of surveillance technologies uh, that are biased and troublesome in many, many ways, and often in efforts to do this in non-transparent so that we don't actually know how they're being used. But so I'll answer the license plate reader question, which is that they are reading license plates. They were originally put in place to help find stolen cars, but now they're used for all level of offenses, for unpaid parking tickets, for people that have warrants out for unpaid parking tickets. They exist mostly where there's more crime, which tend to be lower income communities and communities of color. And then they're turned not to, you know, fighting serious crimes, but often to uh, stopping people and causing traffic stops for things like unpaid tickets and fines and fees. And so we need to be concerned about these uses of these technologies. Same will be true of facial recognition, stingrays, uh, and they need to be regulated in important ways, and the federal government could play a good role in this, but it's mostly playing a bad one. Well, this is, you know, just as the two of you were talking, of, as you can see, we got about 21 new great questions, um, which we can't answer because we were supposed to stop in a couple of minutes. Um, but I do want to um, elevate one question that I think several people have asked, which is, does any place actually do it well now that we could copy? Are there any, 
are there any jurisdictions that have done a particularly good job that might serve as models for us? Um, and, and then I'll leave it maybe with one um, last question, which was uh, from, um, from someone named Arthur who said, what are actionable moves that we as people can take to support this movement? I wish I could ask so many more of the others, um, but maybe are there good examples and how can people on this call support the movement for police reform? Okay, sure, I'll jump in um, on those. So uh, to, to start, so um, who does it well? So I'm gonna be honest and say that um, while I think there are some jurisdictions that are doing some things positive, well, Actually, let me put it this way. I think uh, an implicit in that question is like, which the police department is doing this right or something like that. Um, and I don't think that's the, that's not really where I wanna focus. So I think um, where we need to be thinking about is this move from policing to public safety. So the question is, who's doing public safety well? Who is providing meaningful alternatives to kind of emergency response and crises. Um, and I think there are examples of people doing that. So there are books and materials on transformative justice that are worth looking into. I mentioned a lead as an example of dealing with behavioral health without kind of going toward a kind of police first model. And so when I think about jurisdictions that are doing it well, that is what the, the it is. It is not doing policing better because I think that is inherently a limiting way of thinking of engaging the question. Now, what can people do to provide support? There are many things and I think the number one is to actually engage with people in your local community who are thinking about these issues. So, so, so here's the thing. I think we, we have kind of a short run game and a long term game. And right now we're kind of having a long term conversation in a short term moment. And so that's a bit awkward. But, um, but he, we got to a conversation about the bold proposal of defund and bold ideas of abolition being, being in city councils and things like this because people in their local communities have been organizing and reading and learning and kind of expanding their knowledge base and their imaginations about what's possible. And that's how we're going to provide the framework for the next generation to build something better. Because even if we don't you know, radically transform everything right now, we have to be laying that ground. So that's actually step number one, I think. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I, I had this moment of real anger uh, as the protests were erupting around the country because many politicians were pointing angry fingers at the police. And though there is certainly a lot to be angry about in policing, what seems odd to me was the lack of anger about politicians. So where have they been for the last six months, year, three years, five years, 10 years? I mean, the fact of the matter is that they don't want to deal with issues of public safety. And so they happily turn them over to the police with little front end accountability uh, and hope everything goes well. And then point fingers when things don't go well. And so, you know, what you can do in your community is you can start to actually talk to your uh, elected representatives and city councils uh, and other organs of local government and say, what are you doing to be responsive to the claims that we're not having? And you know, what a number of them are doing is saying, well, we're just gonna slice the police budget X number. And that number's incredibly arbitrary. Uh, not much thought goes into it. I mean, the problem is that we've reached this really important aha moment at a moment when because of COVID, municipal budgets are gonna be suffering greatly. And so I, I worry tremendously about how we're gonna find our way to the right place. But I hope as Monica says, we could do it over time because those are the right questions. And uh, the people that represented us in all this, it's time for them to step up. It's time to, for them to take responsibility uh, for the fact that public safety needs to be provided holistically to all of their communities. Thank you so much, Barry and Monica. I wish we had so much, I wish we had more time to, to expand on this discussion and address some of the now 28 questions of which I think only three have really gotten aired. But thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, and I will hand it over to my colleague, Hilary Rao for the next session. Thanks, Kim and Monica.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Hilary Rao, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next two speakers for our panel on From Dignity to Equity. Our first speaker today is Professor Tom Tyler. Tom Tyler is the Macklin Fleming Professor of Law and Professor of Psychology at Yale University. He is also a founding director of the Justice, Collaborat <coughs> Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School. Professor Tyler's research explores the role of justice in shaping people's relationships with groups, organizations, communities, and societies. And in particular, he examines the role of judgments about the justice or injustice of group procedures in shaping legitimacy, compliance, and cooperation. He is the author of several books, including Why People Obey the Law, Cooperation in Groups, Why People Cooperate, Trust in the Law, The Social Psychology of Procedural Justice, and Social Justice in a Diverse Society. In 2012, he was honored by the International Society for Justice Research with its Lifetime Achievement Award for Innovative Research on Social Justice. Our second speaker today is Dean Song Richardson, who is the Dean and Chancellor's Professor of Law at UC Irvine School of Law. She holds joint appointments in the <coughs> Department of Criminology, Law and Society, and in the Department of Asian American Studies. Her interdisciplinary research uses lessons from cognitive and social psychology to study decision making and judgment in a variety of contexts. She's a leading expert on race and policing and has written numerous articles on police violence. She has also worked with police departments seeking to understand and address the impact of race on their policing practices. Currently, she is working on a book that examines the history of race in the US and its implications for law and policy. Her legal career has included partnership at a boutique criminal law firm, work as a state and federal public defender, and time as an assistant counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. She has won numerous awards and recognitions, including the American Association of Law Schools Derek Bell Award. She was named one of the top women lawyers in California by the Daily Journal and was chosen as one of, as one of the two most influential Korean Americans in Orange County. <laughs> I am very honored to introduce both of them and um, we'll now hand off to our first speaker, Professor Tom Tyler. Well, I'll join everyone else in thanking Phil and thanking Song for setting this up, making this happen. Everyone who's on this today is very interested in police reform. And the question that I'm going to address is the one we're all talking about, which is how do we move that agenda forward? One set of reforms are obvious. We need better accountability for police officers who misuse force. But I'd like to actually talk about what I think is the more central issue for us, and that is changing the underlying organization of policing. I very much agree with what Monica said, that it's really the routine practices of police that ought to be our focus of concern where the real change should be happening. Today, the police are almost all generalists who are trained and equipped to use force to compel compliance. They are armed and focused on harm reduction through crime control. In the popular press, we say the police are warriors. This is a mismatch, in my opinion, of police skills to most of the problems that the police deal with in their everyday lives. These problems involve a variety of routine administrative paroling activities and dealing with social problems that range from disputes among people in the community to dealing with the mentally ill. When the police do deal with crime, they're usually minor crimes that they're dealing with, often property crimes, seldom violent crimes or dangerous offenders. In other words, the police are not trained and equipped to deal with the problems that they most frequently encounter. Almost all of the issues that the police deal with do not call for warriors, basically calls instead for social workers. Having harmed officers deal with these problems doesn't only bring them into a situation for the, which they have no training, but it also puts them in a situation where their use of, use of force to compel compliance actually makes the situation worse. It com communicates threat, it contributes to a spiral of increasing conflict and tension when de-escalation is the better course of action. So we need to reimagine the culture of policing. We need to move away from a warrior culture 
toward a culture of policing with a guardian or service mission? Well, how can this change occur? One approach is to re-educate officers and change the culture of police departments to provide officers with skills built around de-escalation, empathy, procedural justice, implicit bias training. To make cultural change effective, the police need to be trained in a new set of skills that they can use to deal with the problems they actually have in their everyday lives. We can also diversify the kind of officer that we send out to respond to a lot of calls. In particular, officers with special training are officers who are unarmed and less likely to provoke tension. This is not a critique of the police. The ramping up of police officer numbers and the focus on police strategies for crime control came out of an earlier period in the 20th century when there was a focus on a wave of violent crime. But today, crime in America is very low. And at but the same time that crime has declined, something else has happened. And that is urban neglect has become a much bigger issue with the federal government and many local governments retreating and lowering their support for social services. By default, the police have been the agency that's the go-to agency for a variety of problems that could be better addressed by people with more social service or social work skills. This recognition leads to a second way of reimagining policing. The police could retreat from the field of social services and restrict themselves to a much smaller task of controlling serious crime. It's important to control serious crime to maintain public safety, and the police are trained and equipped to do that. The problem is finding the money to build social services so that when the police retreat, there is somebody there to deal with the problems they leave behind. In an era of social service decline, the real problem for us is who will pick up the slack. The difficulty is that the police are often the best organized and well-funded municipal agency in a particular community. As crime has steadily declined in recent decades, police budgets have not declined they remain stable or even increased. The mismatch at an organizational level is that municipalities are using high levels of funding to address low levels of crime. This leads to the policy suggestion of reallocating resources away from the police to social services. Neoliberalism is facing critiques today for its fo focus on market solutions to problems. However, one clear advantage of markets is that companies do not stay in business when they continue to provide a service that people don't need. Policing is different. Our society retains heavy funding for police departments based upon a warrior culture designed to fight crime in the absence of a serious crime problem. This suggests the desirability of the reallocation of resources to fund alternatives to policing. However we end up doing it, increasing allocations to social services would take advantage of this unique opportunity of a low crime era to take a more long-term focus on the underlying issues that lead to crime rather than the short-term focus on crime suppression. Well, what about the police? Too often discussions of policing begin with the existing police framework that the problem is immediate crime control. But even police leaders recognize that you cannot arrest your way out of crime. The best long-term model is one that builds the social, economic, and political strength of communities. If we begin from the community perspective, the question is what role the police can and should play in long-term community well-being. One role is to facilitate engagement in communities by creating a climate of reassurance that promotes community efforts to grow, to develop, to be vital. Reassurance develops out of trust in the police. So a particularly pernicious aspect of this warrior model that dominates current policing is it does not build trust in the police. While crime today is 20 to 30 percent what it was in 1980, trust in the police has not changed since 1980. Declining crime has not built trust. Fortunately, we know how the police can exercise the authority so as to build trust. Trust develops when the police exercise that authority fairly. Because so much of the rhetoric of policing is built around the idea of public safety, it's important to emphasize that when people trust legal authorities, they're also less likely to commit crimes. This effect 
is as important and powerful as any estimates of being caught and punished if you break the law. Focusing on trust does not undermine crime or endanger public safety. The important advantage of trust-based policing is that it also encourages people to both cooperate with the police and to engage in their communities. It promotes resident engagement and community well-being. So a change in the culture of policing, if it could be made to happen, can pivot the police away from a mission of harm reduction to a broader set of desirable goals that facilitate community development. This reorientation benefits the police because it provides them with an important role that they can perform in the 21st century, the role of helping to build vital communities. But I think it's important also to acknowledge that vital communities can be built by the police if they do policing correctly, but also by other municipal agencies or even by community groups. So the role of the police in this effort depends upon their willingness to change the way they think about their mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tyler. Um, I wanna save time for questions at the end. And so please continue to use the Q&A function throughout the talks and we'll get to as many we can, as we can at the end of the talk. And for now, I will pass um, the mic, so to speak, over to Dean Richardson. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here. And I'm thrilled that UCI Law is co-sponsoring this important conversation along with CPE and LDF. And I'm also happy that our UCI Law Review will be publishing articles that arise from it. So please look out for that. And I'm also happy to be on a panel with Tom Tyler, whose impactful work has informed my own. So I wanna to begin uh, today with the premise that until we address the legacy of slavery in our country, and until we confront and dismantle the institutional and systemic racism that exists to this day, we will not achieve racial equity in our criminal justice system more generally or in the police more particularly. So today I will focus on the police, but I wanna make clear my belief that focusing on the institution of the police alone, while important, will be insufficient. We also must simultaneously tackle law and politics. So I've been asked to discuss implicit racial bias and its impacts on policing, and I do think that this topic is important, but perhaps not for the reasons that people typically think. So when I think about implicit bias, what is important about it Unconscious racial bias is what I'm specifically referring to. What's important about it is that it reflects back to us the biases that exist in our systems and in our institutions. So the reason most of us, regardless of our race, unconsciously associate blacks with criminality and dangerousness and whites with innocence is because it's what our brains have learned simply from living in our society. It reminds me a lot of artificial intelligence and we've heard some discussion today already about AI. And when we hear about AI, often people focus on AI and bias. But importantly, it's not that AI systems are biased. These systems simply learn from the data we feed it, historical data from our society. So it's not that the systems are biased, our society is, which is why these systems learn these biases and then reflect them back to us. And our brains act in identical ways to these AI systems, so our minds take in information just like these systems do. Our minds create associations, they rehearse them, and eventually they become unconscious. And then our unconscious biases, these unconscious associations can impact our behaviors our judgments, our perceptions in racially problematic ways. And that's why we have to contend with the impacts of these biases on officer behaviors because these impacts can have immediate problematic and deadly consequences. So for instance, as a result of unconscious bias, officers are more likely to pay attention to black individuals who are present in the environment. We can think of this as a type of unconscious racial profiling. And then once their attention is captured, they're more likely to interpret the ambiguous behaviors engaged in by black individuals as more suspicious and more criminal 
than the identical behaviors engaged in by white individuals. And officers are also more likely to quote unquote see weapons in the hands of unarmed blacks than in the hands of unarmed whites and to more quickly shoot unarmed black individuals as a result. And then if the officer decides to approach an individual, they are more likely to treat black individuals with more hostility than similarly situated white individuals and to perceive, for instance, identical facial expressions as being more hostile and lasting longer on a black individual's face than on a white individual's face. And all of this can occur in the absence of conscious racism on the part of the officer. However, whether or not these actions arise out of conscious or unconscious bias, the impacts are the same. More black people are being stopped, frisked, arrested, convicted, and killed at the hands of the police than similarly situated white individuals. And then because black individuals will then be overrepresented, overrepresented in our criminal justice system, our brains learn to associate blacks with criminality and dangerousness and to associate whites with innocence. And then everything that I just occurred will occur over and over again in an endless cycle. So for all of these reasons, understanding and contending with the effects of implicit bias on officer behaviors is critically important, but too often the conversation ends there, and that is a problem. Because addressing implicit bias is important, but we also must contend with law and politics. We must address the legacy of slavery that is now embedded in all of our institutions and in all of our systems. So these unconscious biases simply reflect to us the problems of race and anti-blackness that continue to exist in our society. So if we want to imagine or reimagine what public safety looks like, if we want to reimagine the criminal justice system and create a more equitable system, ones that do not continue to over-police communities of color, then we must not simply focus on the police as an institution and reimagine that institution, but simultaneously think about the doctrines that allow these policing behaviors to occur, rethink the Fourth Amendment, rethink qualified immunity, and we also need to think about politics. And we must do all of those things simultaneously and not put our attention solely on one institution. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, everybody, if you could please continue to bring questions in. Um, I will get started with a couple of them and we'll get through as many as we can in time. Um, first question we have is, I think for I think this would be a good question for Dean Richardson, but we have a question about the role of educating officers about the role of, about the history of slavery and the legacy of slavery in the United States. And um, can that be part of the solution or part of um, what needs to happen to bring about change? My answer to that is absolutely 100% yes. And I wouldn't limit that to the police. It is a travesty, in my view, how little people in our country understand about the legacy of slavery and how it continues to this day. And I think that leads to people's belief that we don't have systemic and institutional racism today. Um, I, I think the fact that people aren't educated about our racialized history and how uh, we have been, or people of color, Blacks, have been slaves for longer than we've been free. Um, and, and I think it is critically important then for police in particular, but our society in general, to reckon with the history of race in our country in a very real way. So I would add that certainly to the curriculum within the police academy. 
Thank you very much. I have a question for Professor Tyler, which is, um, Professor Tyler, you point to the urgent need for a change in the culture of policing. And my question is, from your perspective, what can communities do who are concerned about public safety? What can they do to help bring about that type of necessary culture change? I think we're already seeing in the moment that we're all in how community pressure, particularly in local pressure, for example, on city councils, on mayors, is having an effect forcing police departments to take seriously reconsidering themselves, what their mission is, how they're going to deploy themselves in the community. So I think communities can first do that by political pressure. Uh, you know, I think that's already being shown to be effective. Also, I think it's true that communities can be helpful by making it clear, as several people have said today, that we don't need the police in a certain way. And if the police are not going to get their act together, they can be replaced. And I think that's a really important message in a time like this, where there are many questions about whether the money that's spent on policing is really justified. And I don't mean any police. I don't think we're talking about removing the police, but the levels of funding that we see in so many communities I think it's perfectly reasonable for communities to be asking why they're doing that and put pressure on the police to explain to them what they're getting for all those resources. That's pressure on the police to really think about their role in the community. Thank you. We have another question about something that I think is always an elephant in the room when we talk about policing, which is qualified immunity. Um, and I thought this question was interesting because um, we had a questioner about what, if anything, can be done about qualified immunity at the local level? Is there anything that local communities who are concerned about this role can do um, to bring about greater police accountability given the limits of qualified immunity on police liability? Long, I'm going to look at you for the, an answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Tom, I was so worried that you were going to look at me for the answer to the question. <laughs> So I will say this, qualified immunity is, thank you for raising that question, it is a serious problem, um, it is especially because one requires, quote unquote, clearly established law in order to overcome the immunity that officers have um, when there is a suit brought against them. So what can local communities do? That is a tough question for me. Um, and the reason it's so tough for me is I've been thinking about this very question for decades. And it is the thing that is so frustrating, right? Because it's the thing that you come up against all the time when you start thinking about how do we um, hold officers accountable? How do we rid departments of officers who simply shouldn't be there? And, and many other officers agree with that. Right? There are certain officers that the rest of the police department just wants out, and it's very frustrating to have them come back in. Uh, and so even if, so what I'm going to do is kind of sidestep the question a bit and, and, and say this. We don't need to, so qualified immunity is important because we could get damages if we were able to actually sue, um, you know, and, and hold individual officers accountable. But we shouldn't simply, and we need to do that, but we shouldn't simply rely on laws that exist. So where can local communities really have an impact? I, I wanna follow up on something that Professor Tyler talked about. As we think about the institution of the police itself and changing the institution of the police itself, so even the officers who are there feel more empowered to deal with the problematic officers that everyone, for the most part, wants to deal with. So how can we do, when we think about the institution of the police, how can we address that? And I'll say one final thing, which gets to the broader point of law and politics. Um, even when a police chief within the department disciplines an officer, those decisions can often get reversed when Within the union contract, it sends it to an arbitrator, right? And then arbitration decisions are made, which often send individuals, problematic officers, back 
to the department. So what are some ways that communities can put pressure on how do we figure out who is arbitrating these cases? How can we impact the boards of review that make these decisions? So law is one thing, and then there's the thinking organizationally and thinking about politics and our legislators, and how can we impact there? And that's where I think communities have a lot of power as we're seeing right now in this moment. Thank you, Dean Richardson. We have another question for you um, from our audience, which is, does making officers aware of implicit bias make them less likely to pull over, frisk, or use force on people of color? And is there a way to combat this problem short of taking weapons and police out of the equation altogether? So I'll go back to the, to the first point. For me, it's not about ridding people of their unconscious biases because that is, in my view now personally, close to impossible, right? Because the moment you turn on the TV, the moment you watch or just interact in our world, your brains are taking in information that becomes unconscious and they will be there. So I often focus on, if we're speaking narrowly right now, how can we safeguard police from acting on those unconscious biases? And yes, I think that awareness of these biases can go there, but that's not enough, right? It's, for me, it's the institution of the police. So the department brings in someone to give implicit bias training. And then it's not just about an individual officer taking actions, him or herself, which they certainly can. But it also is more importantly to me, the police department itself engaging in internal reforms, putting structures in place that can help safeguard our communities from officers acting on their unconscious bias. And that becomes difficult because of police union contracts and all the other impediments that we have. But I think, for, so to end the answer, knowledge of implicit bias to me means how and what systems and structures should we put in place? And should we remove guns from the police? Should we uh, eliminate police altogether? I think that those things should be discussed. Why? because then it's tabula rasa, right? So we can start thinking about what is the role of police in our society, if any. And if we start from there, then we can try to reimagine what we think public safety should look like. No, I agree with everything that Dean Richardson said. I would add one general comment about when people act on bias, and that is in ambiguous situations. So one of the big problems about the police is they often operate alone and outside of a station house where they have enormous discretion to do what they want to do or maybe not even realize they want to do. So one of the things that we can do is we can try to put all forms of accountability on that. Like on some police forces, they have a computer and if you want to stop somebody, you have to punch some information in. If they have to fit a a profile. They have to get points to deserve to be stopped. That's just an example of how officers, even if they wanted to act based upon some unconscious bias, would be controlled by having to be accountable. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we can do is try to beef up those forms of accountability. I couldn't agree more. Those are exactly the type of institutional interventions, right, that, that police departments can take that can help safeguard officers from acting in, in racially problematic ways based on implicit bias. We have another audience question for Professor Tyler, um, which is from someone who works in the community college sector and is interested in how community colleges and police can engage and work together in this task of building and strengthening communities. And I would broaden that question to more broadly, how can other community institutions or should other community institutions be working with police to um, be building up communities? Well, I think it's great that people who are in different academic institutions want to work with the police. And I think one way to do that is to go talk to the police. And, you know, for example, what we have done with our local police is we've gone to talk to them, we've talked to the chief, We've said, how can we help you? 
you know, can we talk to your officers? We've done some training for their officers. Can we help you to solve problems that you might have? Uh, you know, we're here. We'd like to have good policing in our community. What can we do together to make that happen? I think many police departments are starved for expertise. You know, like the, the, as Phil Goff will undoubtedly say later, the data collection in many police departments is a train wreck. Police departments don't necessarily have the resources or the expertise to do things well. If somebody who is qualified can come to them and say, I just want to work with you. I want to help you. I'm not attacking you. I'm not trying to criticize you. I want to have better policing. I think a lot of police departments are very open to that. So I think it's great that the person who asked the question wants to do that. And I hope many more people will do the same thing. Thank you so much to both of you. We are at the end of our time. I want to once again give a huge thank you to both Dean Richardson and Professor Tyler. At this time, we are now going to have a brief intermission and we'll continue our conversation at 525 Eastern Time. So please stick around and we will be right back.
Good afternoon. We're now going to start with our third and final panel. And I have what I consider to be a great role here as a moderator of two phenomenal civil rights leaders. So it's my pleasure today to moderate the panel with Sherilyn Eiffel. And Sherilyn, as all of you probably know, is the president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She's been a civil rights litigator throughout her career, and now she leads an organization that has been on the front lines of social justice, racial justice, and equity. Um, just recently, they put out some materials that I consider to be really like really helpful um, about police union contracts, and she continues to really lead the way um, as we think about how to remake public safety and new models of policing. Also today, um, we have one of our hosts, Dr. Phil Goff, who has just joined Yale University and of course is the CEO of the Center for Policing Equity. Dr. Goff in this work, he both studies psychology and um, African-American studies, but as the head of CPE, he does practical on the ground work with police departments, thinking about their data and basically how to, how to come to a point in time of having unbiased policing, how to essentially eliminate bias from policing. And he does that through data and partnerships with police departments. Um, he also has a new paper out that I think he might talk about today. And so I'm going to start by turning it over to Sherilyn, then I'll turn it over to Phil. And at that point, we'll take questions. So please put comments and questions, and I'll continue to keep track of those. And then we'll come back um, for a discussion after the panelists have an opportunity to speak with us. Thank you. Sherilyn. Thank you, Professor Milgram. I hope you all can hear me. Um, and um, just thank you all for this very rich conversation today. Special thanks, of course, to my friend and uh, partner and really just uh, one of the most brilliant people I'm privileged to know. And that is Dr. Phil Goff, the CEO of the Center for Policing Equity. I'm grateful to all the partners uh, on this convening today and um, especially grateful to Monique Dixon, who um, leads LDF's policing work and has for some time and was so involved in uh, helping organize today's convening. Um, I'm looking down because I've actually set my um, stopwatch because when I start talking about this, uh, it could be nightfall. And I, I know that we wanna have a, a rich conversation and I wanna hear what Phil has to say and I wanna hear your questions as well. So let me just um, be, be very brief and, and see if I can try to frame kind of where my head is at and where the Legal Defense Fund's head is at at this moment. Um, you know, I'm asked very often about this particular moment that we're in since George Floyd was killed. And when I'm asked about uh, this moment and I'm asked particularly about the video of George Floyd being killed, I have often talked about what I call that snapshot of Officer Derek Chauvin with his knee on George Floyd's neck, uh, looking out uh, as, as he does and why that is so significant for me. Uh, and um, I guess I wanna make a plea that it be significant for all of us. Uh, I have seen many, many videos of police violence against unarmed African-Americans, too many to name. Uh, I have lived with this issue since I was 10 years old when an NYPD officer shot another 10 year old, shot and killed another 10 year old, Clifford Glover. And that stayed with me uh, because it was actually my first kind of introduction to even thinking about uh, police officers beyond whatever I had seen uh, on the Mod Squad on TV. Uh, this little boy was my age. He was out with his father on a Saturday morning uh, and plainclothes officers jumped out of a car, began to chase him and his father shot the boy uh, and claimed that they thought he fit the description of a thief. Uh, and uh, the officer was tried. It was one of the few cases uh, during that period in which an officer was actually tried in New York for that kind of crime, uh, but he was acquitted. Uh, and this really devastated the killing of this boy and uh, this whole incident really devastated the Glover family. I hadn't thought about that case in 40 years until I was in St. Louis a week or two after Mike Brown was killed. And I started talking about it on the radio, it just came. And by the time I got back to my hotel room, someone who had heard me tweeted at me uh, the story that of this incident that happened that I wasn't even sure I knew the details anymore, but it turned out that everything I remembered was true. I remember the name of the officer, that his name was Shay. Um, I remembered where it happened. I remember details of it that I shouldn't have remembered, but I did remember because it was so powerful. That's just for me personally. For the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, we've been involved with this issue for a very long time too, certainly since 
uh, our founding in 1940 and more specifically in the late 1940s, uh, beginning with the, the Groveland Boys case, which many of you may know about if you read the 2013 Pulitzer Prize winning book, Devil in the Grove by Gilbert, Gilbert King. And the central incident uh, in that case involves young men who are uh, accused of a crime uh, and as they're being transported, uh, they are killed by uh, a, a renowned racist sheriff, Willis McCall. And Thurgood Marshall, the founder of the Legal Defense Fund, and Jack Greenberg, the second director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, uh, are defending um, several of the, uh, one of the boys who survived, uh, but also trying to bring justice in the killing of this young man by Sheriff McCall, who was, of course, never brought to justice. And we've been working on these issues for decades. LDF represented uh, Clean Tree Garner, the father of the 15-year-old who was killed as he was uh, running away from a home and trying to climb a fence and was shot in the back by police officers in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, at leading to the, the Supreme Court's decision in that famous case, Tennessee versus Garner. And we represented Clean Tree Garner uh, for nearly a decade. And the decision in that case was largely regarded as a victory, right? The Supreme Court said, you, you know, you couldn't shoot uh, what they call the fleeing felon in the back, right? And that that was not something that police officers could do in a way that was consistent uh, with the Fourth Amendment. You couldn't shoot someone just because you wanted to catch him and you feared that you wouldn't be able to catch him. Uh, you had to show that the person was in fact a threat. And this 15-year-old boy who was accused of burglarizing, I think uh, three and a half dollars was obviously not a threat. So we've been involved with this issue for a long time. And the reason why I raise all of this is because I feel deeply and felt deeply implicated by the, the look of Officer Derek Chavan as he knelt on the neck of George Floyd. He knew that there were cameras all around him. There were people around him filming this incident. And he had his hands casually in his pockets and he was staring out at us. And I believe he was staring at each and every one of us. He was staring at us because he believed that nothing would happen to him. He believed that he could do what he wanted to do with impunity. And that expression, that snapshot represents failure. It represents failure of the American legal system. And I have been um, not shy about leaning on my colleague, my, my colleague lawyers uh, to take responsibility for the failures of the legal system to bring true justice uh, to the system of impunity that protects police officers too often in these circumstances. He was looking out at our society in general that has allowed this kind of conduct to get a pass. I believe he was looking at law enforcement uh, and, and looking at them, the recognition that this is what we can do. And you have shown by your conduct that I can do this and get away with it. The worst part of that snapshot of that moment that I said showed us the soul of this country in the same way that the snapshot that we many of us saw in Jet Magazine, even if it was years later of Emmett Till was a snapshot into the American soul at a particular moment or the snapshot of the beating on the Edmund Pettus Bridge was a snapshot into the American soul. This is a moment, this is a picture that captures something powerful and important that we cannot turn away from. And what makes it even more distressing is that even at this moment, even after the officers have been arrested, even after the officers have been charged, even after the officers have been fired, even as the attorney general has been brought in to assist with the prosecution of the case, even as there have been protests that have erupted in 50 states, even, if there, even as there have been protests around the world that in which people are raising up the term Black Lives Matter and are recognizing that something must change, even as all of that is true, not one of us on this call today can say that Officer Chavan was wrong. We actually don't know whether anything will actually happen to him besides being fired from the police department. And I can say that with confidence because we know that just across the river in St. Paul, we saw Philando Castile killed by an officer and we know that that officer was tried and acquitted. We know that the officer who killed Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when Mr. Crutcher had his hands up was tried and acquitted because we know that the officer that we saw chase Walter Scott in a park in North Charleston and shoot down this 53-year-old man in the back and, and seem to have tried to set a scene that suggested uh, he was threatened by Walter Scott 
we know that when he was tried, the jury was in fact hung, and that the only reason that Michael Slager is in prison today is because there was a federal civil rights prosecution against him. That tells us that we are surrounded and deep in the clutches of a failing system that requires our attention. I say all that because I know that there are many people who are very concerned about how we're going to address the system. And I wanna kind of close out my remarks by suggesting that it's gotta all be on the table. That at this moment when the rhetoric seems for some people frightening or destabilizing or scary, I think we have to recognize that the monumental failures require us to dig deep. It requires us to dig deep into how we have allowed this moment to come to be. And that's why we have been talking about reimagining public safety. In fact, at LDF, we've been talking about this since 2015. It is time for a new paradigm. It is time for a new way of thinking about uh, public safety and how we have allocated the responsibility for public safety, the funding for public safety, the vision for public safety uh, in ways that ultimately have allowed moments like this to happen. I'm excited, therefore, that we are at this moment. I'm excited that we're able to have this conversation, that the progress we've made over the last five years from the killing of Eric Garner, who said, I can't breathe, to the killing of George Floyd, is that we are having this conversation that begins at this point, that begins at the point of recognizing the need to reimagine public safety, not to tinker at the edges of something fundamentally broken, but to actually go in and do the hard work of confronting a truly deep, uh, an important American failure that must be resolved uh, if we are to have a democracy worthy of the name. So I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sherilyn. And now, uh, Dr. Goff. Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, thank you, Anne. I don't know whose idea it was to have me speaking after Sherilyn. Um, that's never a good idea. It's, it's not a good spot in the lineup. Um, if anybody gets the choice, you want to talk beforehand. Um, I'll echo the words and sentiments of my colleagues um, who have uh, all talked about this moment as unprecedented, um, at least in, in, within our lifetimes. Um, I also wanna echo something that I've been saying for the last you know, 10 weeks we've been doing this, which is that this moment is bigger than policing. And if we think it's not, then we really have failed. Um, uh, policing is always the spark, but this moment really represents uh, the, all the, the folks who are still in the streets out there today. It represents really the past due notice on the unpaid debts owed particularly to black Americans for 400 plus years. Um, uh, there's, there's a reason why we moved so quickly from talking about um, uh, the excesses of police abuse to taking Confederate monuments down. It's because that history, that unbroken lie is one and the same. Um, so we have this moment where we're looking to do something totally different. And at the same time, we still have the systems we have. And even for the most radical of abolitionists, none of them believe that tomorrow what's going to happen is we're going to have no law enforcement. So I want to enter into this a phrase that I think we're going to be hearing more of, which is we've talked about harm reduction as we do um, uh, public health, right? When we do needle exchanges, when we do uh, safe injection sites, we talk about harm reduction. We need to talk about harm reduction when it comes to public safety as well. So what we're doing inside of police departments is that harm reduction, that estimation of costs um, uh, that our current public safety uh, systems have, at the same time we're thinking about new paradigms um, and right-sizing our investments. So today, because it is so difficult to think about how we get from where we are to where we're going, though there exist systems out there where we're going already, I want to spend a little bit of time going micro, being a justice nerd, if you will. So I want to talk about a little bit of time about one mechanism for keeping our values safe on their way from ideas to implementation. Right? And the thing I want to talk about is the state body that grants police officers their license to take away life and liberty, and how that body can be used to protect us all better. And I should say, before I get too deep into my little talking points here, um, uh, the research framing I want to talk about was done collaboratively. Right? It was uh, a joint project with LDF and CPE. So I want to thank Monique Dixon, Shelen Eiffel as well, obviously. Um, and then CPE's uh, Kim Buchanan, and Hillary Rao in particular, uh, who's just a powerhouse on these issues. So if you've got questions afterwards about all the things I'm going to say about this state body, please ask Hillary because she knows much more than I do. All right, so in that context, I'll just ask a bunch of rhetorical questions, and I will guess that you're all stunned by your silence because that's how mute buttons work. Would any of you ever want to go to a surgeon whose negligence costs someone their life? 
you had a choice. You have a surgeon who's never killed somebody and a surgeon who's negligent cost somebody their life. Who signed up for the second one, right? Nobody. Would you ever go to a lawyer to defend you when they had been found to have been negligent in their defense of other clients, right? Anybody raising their hand for that one? The lovely option in, in most of the society is you don't have to do that because those individuals would be decertified. Their licensure would be revoked, right? Because we regulate doctors and lawyers because they literally have the power to take away life in the case of doctors or, or liberty in the case of lawyers. So they have their licenses granted by the states and they're regulated by professional bodies. Because if you can take away life or liberty, you should be regulated. Now for almost everybody on this call, it is not a surprise, but we don't do that with law enforcement, which is bananas because they can do both, take away life and liberty. But I wanna ask you a question that is fundamentally about that. So since we know that law enforcement has the power to take away life and liberty and isn't regulated in quite the same way, I'm wondering how many of the folks who are here know whence police derive their powers to do that. I say whence because that actually means from when. I don't have to say from whence, it's whence, it's just one word. The answer to that, for those of you who don't know, is a body called state posts. That's peace officer standards and trainings. And there's a body named that or that has the same essential function in every single state. They create the conditions for officers to be licensed to use physical violence in the interest of the state. So what posts do, the post powers, they set minimum selection standards for officers. So they decide what standards you need to meet to become an officer. That's pretty important. So if you can't be an officer, if you've got a weed conviction, right? Like that's the state post that can say something different about that, at least statewide. They regulate officer training. So all the officer training standard minimums that's set by state posts. They certify and therefore decertify officers who commit misconduct, at least in 46 states, and three others are, are, are considering adding that power. Um, and in a few states, they actually already set the minimum policy floored on topics set by the legislation. Those are incredibly powerful. They exist in all 50 states, and they can regulate proactively. And what I mean by that is they don't need to wait for a pattern and practice investigation. They don't need to wait for somebody to sue, or they don't even have to, to wait for a phone call. They can say, this is what we want in terms of public safety, and then, like Captain Picard, they make it so. So if posts, commissions exist in all 50 states, why haven't you heard about them? And what are they doing right now to make all of this stuff that we're talking about better? And so here are a couple of things that are wrong with state posts, which is why I'm talking about them. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the things that state posts can do. And I'll do this in a sort of 10,000 foot uh, view section. You can see a draft of this paper, we're hoping sometime soon on the website. But the two things that are wrong with state posts that are sort of urgent for right now, is first, they aren't structured to care about us, meaning folks in vulnerable communities. And the folks in those communities are not running them. Here's what I mean. Um, post, state posts don't have legislative or organizational mandate to use their powers to protect vulnerable communities from harms in particular. Now, many legislatures are silent as the, pur the purpose of posts, but for the ones who say anything, they're mostly there to say, we want professional quality. We want public safety standards, right? State posts um, uh, never, they don't say anything about um, officer eth ethics, um, only two um, mentioned promoting equity, and there's just one state post that says they're there to protect citizen rights. Thank you, Utah. So there are ways that you could fix this, right? You could look to the examples of um, the regulatory bodies for medicine, for nursing, for law, which make protecting the public the highest goal of those regulatory agencies. You could do the same with state posts and add a specific mission to promote equity. This can be the place you shift the mission of policing at the state level. We all know there's about 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the United States, 75% of which are 25 officers or fewer, and 1,000 are just one guy. That's always a guy, right? <clears throat> that means it's gonna be hard to go department by department and fix these things, but you got 50 states. You can go post by post. Anyway, the second area where posts are pretty deficient is the communities that experience the most policing have little or no voice on most post commissions. Now this is a structural problem because by law, most post commissions save most seats for active duty officers or you know, law enforcement equivalents, right? 
And most commissions that don't have uh, seats, most post commissions don't have seats for the public, but even states that ostensibly save seats for members of the public, they often fill them by getting retired law enforcement. So you've rotated off the post as current public safety, you retire, you rotate right back on. And by contrast, again, nursing boards, medical boards almost always have public representatives and most attorney disciplinary uh, committees do as well. So at a minimum, post commissions need to have at least the level of public representation um, that you'll find for other professional regulatory bodies. And you can make the argument they need more because it's easier to get restitution when you're suing a doctor or a hospital or a law firm or a lawyer than it is when you're suing a police department. And yet we have, we have I would say, negligently little um, public representation in the folks who set the standards. Now, once you fix those standards, what else can get fixed? Well, a state post can screen out problem officers because you can staff state posts to do rigorous background checks of the kinds that are currently not possible, especially in the smaller departments. You can set specific and detailed uh, cases for mandatory decertification, and then you could staff it to enforce them. Now, legislatures are going to have to expand the power of some state posts to do this, but it's absolutely within the purview of many state posts. You can also reshape professional norms through mandatory training, both more training and more specific training on the values that are represented from the community. You could even uh, certify, you could require that folks have to talk with and engage with community before they're ever certified as law enforcement. Right? You can adopt model policies that center communities. You can require officers know when the problem is not right for officers in the first place, when officers need to call for their own background for some backup, for some other folks, right? <clears throat> but again, all of this is part of a larger process. What I wanna leave folks with is the reason why I'm doing this picayune thing after Sherilyn spoke so powerfully about how both she feels it and how all of us, how at least many of us have felt this moment, why I'm getting so nitty gritty is because we're about to start the process of transitioning from protest to policy. And I wanna make sure we don't lose the thread. Because in 2014, when this generation of folks woke up to this issue, many people would argue we got nothing from Michael Brown Jr. In 1992, when the nation was set on fire, literally and physically, by the actions in, in Los Angeles after the not guilty verdict in the, in the case of the Rodney King beating, two years later, we got the crime bill. And in the mid to late 60s, when the country was on fire, looking at how do we think about fully integrating and giving not just liberty, but freedom to black folks, we got Nixon. I don't wanna leave 2020 worse than we got here. And I gotta say, that's still really a possibility, even as we, if we narrow the focus on policing. So I want us to make sure that the micro gets married back up to the visionary. With that, let me stop babbling. Let's get to questions. Okay, great. Thanks for the time. So one of the first questions we have, and I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, but I think it's worth um, just sort of thinking this through with you and Cheryl and Phil, is that there's a question about sort of boilerplate policing policies. And I would sort of think about policing, you know, you have budget, policies, staffing, civilian oversight or involvement. So those sort of four buckets. And so the question really goes to policies, and, and I think it's an interesting question as you're, th you're thinking about licensing individual officers, much the same way we have driver's licenses to drive and so on. How would, how would the standards you set there impact policing policies or, you know, is, is this seen to be connected or you, do you envision this sort of as separate levers of reform? So Sherilyn, I see you speaking, but Sherilyn, I think you're on mute. Odd. No, we got you now. Okay, great. Um, no, I wanted to comment on this and I, I wanna hear what Phil says, but I, I wanted to comment because coming from Phil's comments, I wanna be clear also that um, I guess my fear, this is where I feel a little bit of tension with uh, what I just heard is that we may get too micro. And because as, as we pointed out, we, we do have 18,000 police departments, right? And what that says to me as a civil rights lawyer is I go federal at that point, right? That, that comes out of the tradition of civil rights, right? When you have 
when you have you know 13 recalcitrant states in the former Confederacy that won't accept Brown versus Board of Education, you need Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? You need to say, we will take your money, right? We will not give you any federal money if you continue to engage in this conduct because the whack-a-mole that LBF was doing was incredibly exhausting, wearing us out, and often not successful. So I just, before we get to what I think are the very, very important and legitimate micro pieces that Phil is talking about that are gonna have to be knit into this superstructure that we focus on the superstructure, which itself has not been yet created. Now, I will say when we left the Rodney King unrest and we left 1994, we, yes, we ended up with the crime bill, but we also ended up with the Law Enforcement Misconduct Act, which is the statute that allows the Department of Justice to engage in pattern and practice investigations, sure. which are actually quite valuable. So I agree that part of my job as I see this window that we know is going to close or these windows of civil rights opportunity and Phil is, you know, shares, we share the same view, like you've got to come out of this with stuff, right? Structural change and tools that you can use on the other side. We need some of those macro tools. That's why we need to end qualified immunity. That's why we need the George Floyd Policing Act. That's why we need to get serious about not providing federal funds to uh, police departments that engage in discrimination and really using the same tool of Title VI that we use on school districts that we, we need to use for police departments. That's why we need to change the standard uh, in, the, in the criminal statute, the, the federal civil rights criminal statute from willfulness to recklessness. So the Department of Justice, assuming you had a Depart Department of Justice that was actually interested in enforcing civil rights laws, actually could uh, prosecute uh, bad officers. So there, there is a superstructure that's important as well. And so I think when people kind of turn away from Congress, because I know we all feel the same way, we are living with an administration and a Justice Department that has no interest in these issues. And so we've all devolved a lot of our work locally. And there is a lot of work to do locally to build some success stories so that we can hold them up as models. But we need a stronger superstructure. And that's where uh, ensuring that we have some strong legislation uh, is critically important. Obviously, at this moment with this Senate, we're not going to have it. We will see what this election produces. But on the other side of it, we need some federal legislation as we got in 1994, unfortunately balanced, of course, out by the crime bill, but that at least we got a tool that here we are years later, right, with a consent decree in Baltimore and uh, a consent decree in various other places, using the tools that we got out of that legislation. And I want to make sure that we're attentive to that so that we create a structure around it that will allow the kinds of very important micro fine uh, reforms that Phil is talking about, uh, will put them in an environment in which they can succeed. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more with, with Sherilyn. Um, the, the goal of talking about posts is first of all, I'm shocked at the number of folks who had no idea that they existed, right? Like how do we not know whence police get the license to take away life and liberty? Like that's, that's a bananas thing in just a democracy. But also I think about this work as sort of like um, hooks and ties. Um, so you need the federal leverage, but it needs to be able to be tied on to something. So wouldn't it be amazing if we started to pay attention to posts and then you had federal regulations on, you know what, nobody in the state gets anything if the state post hasn't done X, Y, and Z. That's a force multiplier. So I'm trying to create the kind of levers that go from the micro and can be put, brought back to the superstructure. If you've got a superstructure and nothing to tie it to, you got nothing. If you've got a whole bunch of things to tie it to and no superstructure, also nothing. So this has to get built at all of these levels, which is why we need so very much work, which is why I keep saying, don't look away, folks. This is the time when it meet, when it, we need to start making sure rubber is meeting road. I think we only have one minute left. Um, and so, Carolyn, do you want to um, respond? Or one, one question, which I think is worth just sort of throwing out there is, you know, when you think about all these tools, all these macro tools, what do we do now, right, in today's political world, in the federal political system that exists? And I think of this all the time, and I'll throw this to both of you. I work with police departments and communities where, we're having all these big policy conversations and at the same time, the budgeting process is happening. And so even the conversations when people will sit in a room and tell you, this is what I wanna see happening, I'm watching out the other side of my eye and seeing that exactly what's always happened is happening in the budget today. So how do we think about this now in the moment? Yeah, I, it's one of the reasons why we put out our police union contracts toolkit uh, last week is, is really trying to get uh, uh, tools 
into the hands of people to be able to engage these processes, right? It's not enough to just say, this is how much we want out of the budget. It's really understanding if we're gonna reimagine public safety, if we're going to create a public safety core, C-O-R-P-S, right? A core that is not solely law enforcement, right? Mental health practitioners and uh, youth uh, uh, counselors and people engaged in community conferencing and other alternative dispute resolution techniques and uh, support for homelessness and, and, and so forth. If we're going to talk about all of that as, a, as part of the public safety apparatus, then we need to know, well, what is the funding that we need for that? And how could we create and actually make this something that's positive for communities that we can allow communities to have better control? Because honestly, one of the things I fear is even in talking about moving money, defunding and moving money from police departments, that it will end up in other dysfunctional agencies within the city. I, if we're gonna seriously talk, about defunding and we're going to talk about removing some of those responsibilities that I think Tom Tyler referred to earlier that police officers don't need to do, then we should be talking about how can we build within communities the structure to be able to address those kinds of issues so that you are not dialing 911 when your mentally ill child is in distress. You're not dialing 911 because there's somebody homeless who's been sitting on your street for two days. So number one is the tools to be able to engage exactly what you talked about, which is the budget issue. And that means we need uh, urban planners. That means we need people who have experience with city budgets. We need to really be sitting at tables, grappling with existing budgets, so that when we talk about, when we, so that we're not just using slogans, but we're really talking about how one goes about this reimagination in very, very concrete terms. But I just wanna say, cause this may be the last thing I get to say most importantly, is that this has, part of the reimagination is about who we respect in this process. That means respecting other narratives. It can't be just about the heroism of police and how police put their lives on the line, the stuff we read every day. It has to be about the heroism of communities. It also has to be about the value of the lives of people in those communities. But most importantly, it has to be about their voice, that community members have a right themselves to articulate a vision that they want to be in their own community. And that voice has to be given respect and primacy. And one of the ways you give that voice respect is not only by listening to it, but by allocating resources to support it. So I do think we, don't, we shouldn't blow past this idea that the community has to be at the table and has to be allowed to bring to bear with the technical assistance they need, the ability to actually actualize this reimagined public safety. And one of the things I fear is that people want this to be something esoteric and in the sky and, and feel like they're listening to communities when in fact it really is something very pragmatic, something very real, and something that will empower communities to be part of this conversation. Until we recalibrate that, re that level of respect, we are gonna continue to see the kind of unrest that we see because communities can feel that they are not respected or listened to. And they are the a missing part of the equation in terms of thinking about how we recalibrate and make these changes that so desperately we need to make. Thank you so much to both of you for a wonderful panel and a presentation today. Phil, should I turn it to you to close? Oh, so is it, is it, it's on me? Okay, I'm seeing non, so it's on me. Um, and once again, I get to talk after Sherilyn. Who the heck set this up? Who was that guy? I gotta have a word with him. Um, so I, I, I just, I have to thank, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Sherilyn. Thank you, um, Tom. Thank you, Song. Uh, thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Barry. Um, thank you, Jesus. Uh, this has been an incredible um, two hours. Thank you, everybody, all 180 plus of you who are still here. Um, again, thank you, Monique from LDF. Thank you in particular, Kristen Powell, uh, who just worked her behind off to get all this stuff done. I'm hoping that what all of us take from this um, is, I mean, it's, it's exemplified by Sherilyn's last words here. There's reason to be skeptical of people who have been in this space for this long who haven't gotten a lot done but we have never needed experts more to do the work of translating the big ideas that are driving this moment into something that we actually get to live with. Where what we're looking at in this moment is a, is a moment when things are different on the other side of it than they were before. That's my fear, is that we move forward without that level of expertise, and then we see the kind of backlash that is all too common in American history. Um, Not hearing you. So we lost your, we lost your, your sound.
<laughs> Try again. Nope. No. So we're not we're not hearing you. So I think I will uh, take this opportunity as the moderator to thank all the panelists um, to basically say this is an incredible vision that has been put forth today. And I think you know the work is just beginning. Uh, have we got you, Phil? Uh, no. Uh, but thank you to everyone who joined, and thank you. There we go. Yes. Come on. You're back. There we go. I mean, come on now. <laughs> let's, let's get back. close this out. <laughs> Um, as if as if we needed another sort of deeper metaphor that when the specifics and the technocratic malfunctions that everything is lost right um, one of my favorite um, uh, uh, readings of scripture is uh, Proverbs 28 19 um, where where the there is no vision um, the people perish and I love it because it's a mistranslation the original Hebrew original um, so uh, the word is para which means to be shaken loose because if you don't have a vision of a divine future, you can be shaken loose in your journey. So in this moment of technological failure, maybe I got a little bit of the pulpit coming back to me on a Monday. Um, let us not be shaken loose. Let us have some vision. Let us not look away. Thank you all for joining. Um, and we continue to look forward to working together with all of you. God bless and happy Monday. <laughs>